we did a huge conceptual lesson yesterday, okay? So now we're going to get a little more into the nuts and bolts. So I want you to first write down these two things. Just to remember what's going on. For the four, and I'm now, I can now finally just say it without any, um, without any worry that I'm going to remind you of something that I haven't addressed yet. For the four conic sections, right? And um, I've, got, I've got three of them here. For the four conic sections, we're very familiar with circles and we are very familiar with parabolas. And so the, the topic, conics, kind of focuses on these guys because they're much newer, okay? Now, for each of these, we have a critical algebraic relationship which shows, for the ellipse, which generally looks something like this, and for the hyperbola, which looks something like this, there is a critical relationship between the A and the B, which are all about those horizontal and vertical proportions, like how much it's stretched this way, how much it's stretched that way, and with the eccentricity of the conic section. Okay? So the relationship is B squared equals, now for an ellipse, what's B squared equal to? A squared, a squared. One, minus. 1 minus E squared. Very good. And for a hyperbola, good morning. For a hyperbola, it is reversed for the 1 minus E squared, right? So it's still B squared and A squared. But in here you have E squared minus 1. Please, 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 with like a color or something, right? Put down, like this is, there's a reason why. This is not just like random algebra that I need to like memorize, and like which one is which, you know, that thing. If what you remember is that an ellipse has an eccentricity in the range of zero to one, right, then it must make sense that e is, is gonna be a small number. Like it's a fraction, you square it, it gets smaller. And so in order for everything to stay positive here, you've gotta have one minus e squared, whereas, if E is going to be some big number, like 2 or 3 or 500, then in order for things to stay positive, mainly for B to stay positive, B squared, then E squared has to be up the front. Okay? Please get that there's meaning behind this order. Do not memorize these as meaningless algebraic statements. Okay? Now, once you use these, like let's go back to ellipses, which we're a little more familiar with. We spent a good deal of time on them. What do you then go ahead and do? Once you, you start with that line, what, what do I do after that? Okay, yeah, very good. I'm going to go from here, right? I'm going to punch in whatever A and B might be, 9, 16, etc. And that'll give me the eccentricity, which I then use to find the foci and directrices. These are the main features, right? And we saw that the foci we can find at, this is in the ellipse, they're at, where are they? Plus or minus AE, comma zero. And of course, this is, uh, we're all thinking just in standards at the moment, like the original ones. So this is horizontally oriented, right? So that's why my foci have gone that way. And the directrices are where? Very good. So again, they've gone this way, and I've got these vertical lines happening on the outsides of my ellipse. Okay? Now, mercifully, and I didn't bother going into the geometry of it, because it ends up being Number one, quite repetitive. Number two, you never need to know the proof. Number three, you end up with the exact same answer. The third kind of directrices for the hyperbola are those coordinates. Okay? But the hyperbola has more features than the ellipse because of the, the geometry of the shape. Okay? Um, for instance, we noticed that there were asymptotes. Asymptotes? And whenever you grab something with asymptotes, it's important that you state what the asymptotes are and you, and you show them then. Okay. I'm going to show in a minute how you find what the asymptotes are. There's one other feature that's important, and they're called the vertices. Right? Now, for an ellipse, you would say, I've got a shape, and it intersects with the coordinate axis. So I've got one, two, three, four intercepts for a regular ellipse that's centered on the origin. Obviously, if it's not centered on the origin, if I, if I move somewhere, it, it might have no uh, actual intercepts, but those are still the critical points. Okay. But for a hyperbola, the intercepts are not just intercepts. They represent a change in the behavior of the hyperbola, right? In <coughs> fact, it's the same behavior uh, that we see in a parabola, right? Where's that? It's a turning point. Okay? Now, being that, these are, and I put it in inverted commas, these turning points are oriented horizontally, right? 
You can't really call these turning points the way we would think about them in calculus, okay? Because there's not a change from like negative gradient to positive gradient. There's not even a gradient in here. And the gradient is two different things here because it's a relation, right? So, so why don't call these turning points even though it's kind of what they look like? We're going to call them vertices. <laughs> now on this hyperbola, you might have remembered you can't find any y-intercepts, right? you can't find them. So you look for the x-intercepts by letting y equal zero. So look at that. What are the vertices going to be when you're solving this equation? Plus, minus a. Plus or minus a, right? Oh, a becomes zero. Really. So I'm going to pop that in. That's fairly easy to see. Now let's get to our last piece. Let's, let's now get some algebra back out, and let's go after these asymptotes. I'm going to start by writing the equation that I have heard, but that's going to be my starting point. And I want to know, OK, we, we pulled a bit of a trick with square roots and limiting behavior last time. <coughs> we saw, I think, for our example, it was like the square root of 3 times x, plus or minus the square root of 3 times x. Those were the two asymptotes we got. So what I want to do now is that same, I want to rehearse that same method, but I'm going to have to deal with the algebra. So first thing, I'm going to need to get y squared, and I'll get him on his own. Right? So it looks to me like if I add him to that side, I'll subtract him from that side. So I'm getting x squared on a squared. Take one. I'll just do this in a row. OK, this is good. Do you remember what I did after this? Where did I, where did I go from here? Times it by b. Uh, yeah, I'm going to multiply through to get rid of this denominator, but careful, it's b squared. Okay. So y squared equals this. Now, at this point, I can either, I've got a whole bunch of different things I have to, yes, this yes. Uh, yep. yes. Okay. At this point, I've got a couple of things I could do. Um, I did an awkward factorizing step, do you remember? A factorization that didn't look very obvious at all, it was very counterintuitive, uh, but it put an x squared on a denominator. Do you remember what I factorized out? So a couple of different ways I can do it. Basically, I factorized out this whole first term, right, to get one there. Do you remember why the one was so important? It's going to come underneath the square root. So if I bring b squared, a squared, x squared, all out the front, right, you get one take away. Now, just be watchful. There's, there's a b squared there. So it looks like I'm going to be left with a squared on x squared. Does that, that look alright? Uh, and I've got y squared over here. Last step now before I get to my um, actual limit area. It's plus or minus the square root of all of that. Okay. However, I can do this now that you know what the answer is going to be. And you can see all of these things being squared out the front. I can probably actually write that right at the beginning and then leave the square root until later. Right? The square root of this is going to be b on a. The square root of this is going to be x. Now, just keep in mind, by the way, the square root of a square is an absolute value, but why do I not really worry about that? Because the plus or minus kind of overrides that. And then you've got this guy left under the square root. Okay. Now I've just run out of space, unfortunately. But now I can get my limiting behavior happening, right? Because when I take the limit as x approaches infinity, right? You can see um, this term vanishes away, and you just get um, 1 underneath the square root. So that leaves you with this. In the example we looked at before, b on a was root 3. Okay? So they're those, they're the asymptotes. right? So I can actually just say, look, I can go straight to this now. I don't need to rehearse this process every single time. I can just go ahead and I can say, y is going to be equal to plus or minus b on a x. That's how the proportions gives the asymptote. 